You're watching Kirk's Polo Report, bringing you all the high goal Argentine triple crown polo action. Today I've got an interesting interview with AAP Live's play-by-play announcer, Andres Ugarte Lorraine. Here's about a minute of Andres in action. Towards the board with the chance of taking the game all the way to the other end, Adolfo. The shout in there by Pelon, Pega, hit it. And now Poroto Cambiaso for La Dolfina, the long approach looking for Pelon Sterling, who was running up from the here comes Pelon into the danger zone to extend the lead for La Dolfina. Pelon Sterling, second goal today. Here comes Pelon Sterling to score before the end of the chapter. Nice approach by the Uruguay and into the danger zone. Pelon, 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 the worst person behind. Nice follow up by Juan Obrito, San Francisco Elizalde. Going wide. Juan Martín Subía, and it's raining goals here by Juan Martín Subía, who finds the net for the third time in this chapter to make it 7-6. What a way. Today's guest is the man making that great play-by-play call for AAP Live, Andres Ugarte Lorraine. I've listened to you for over 50 hours, at least at broadcast time, so I feel like I know you. You seem familiar. Your voice sounds very young. No, no, yeah, yeah, no, no. Yeah, not that young. Um, 37, actually, but, um, you know, usually and when you're calling the game by yourself uh, w- without, a, like, a guest commentator, uh, there is no there is no much space, you know, to speak yeah. about you. And also, at the same time, I always say the same. I mean, the characters are the ones who are inside the field. They are right. the ones who are uh, helping the players, so... It's only about them, you know. You had the guy from the AAP with you. He was really interesting. He was good. Yeah, uh, that time was uh, Pepe Santa Marina. Uh, he knew a lot of uh, One of the yeah, yeah, yeah. Because actually, he's uh, in charge of all the polo at the Hellingham Club. So he's been involved with the club uh, right. with Hellingham for for a long time. Uh, so he knows everything, you know, every single aspect of the history, who played the tournament, who won it. Right. Um, well, actually, and he has, of course, a lot of relationship with the people in English polo because the Hellingham Club actually holds a, a great history with the English right. in Argentina. I'm very amazed at how you can call a game in a second language. Where did you learn to speak English so perfectly? Well, actually, I had English at, at school. Uh, in, in many parts in Argentina, you have English as a subject. But of course, while I was uh, at school, I never really paid attention to it. I mean, always my mother said, uh, you have to pay attention to the language and everything. But then I, as, as the years went by and I started to grow up and traveling, and I, I get to understand how important it was. You must have spent some real time in the States or in England because you're far too smooth to learn your English completely out of a book. Um, yeah, I mean, when I, I travel a couple of times, like in vacations with friends, and then around, I would say, 2012, I went to Australia for a year on a work and holiday visa. Maybe there That's what did I it. started to pronounce it or right. <laughs> better or, or change the structure, you know, because right. at the beginning when you start uh, speaking like a foreign language, what you do or what I did at least was like using the same structure in Spanish to speak it in English, you know. Absolutely. So, How did you learn about Polo? How did you get involved in the game? Well, I, actually, I, I always like like watching and reading every, every sport. And when I was uh, younger... Um, something that we have in Argentina related to polo is that La Nación, which is one of the main papers in Argentina, right. they always publish everything that has to do with the Triple Crown. Also, I don't know, uh, ESPN, right. they broadcast the, the Open since 1994. So as a matter of fact, uh, if you're interested in sport, you have it at hand, you know, right. uh, polo. It's not that it's a popular sport, but Right. Uh, in comparison to other countries, um, y- you get it there. So I, I was interested in, in, I don't know, I remember India Chapalifu, right. Elastina, 
Cambiar, so the Eggies, the Merlos, and all that generation of play. Mo mostly, I'd say, in the early 90s, yeah. uh, with but the four brothers right. together, which was a very popular team because also, not only because the way they played polo and they were a 40 old team in the Estrapalo for one right. and in the Estrapalo for two, but also because of the sponsors by that time, right. you know, that there was like uh, cigarette branding. You might be too young to remember, but in the um, mid 80s, the three brothers, when Marcos was too little, played with Alex Garahan, El Grandote. What a team that was. I think he is one of the greatest backs, along with Juanma, to ever play the game. He was, uh, you know, incredible. He actually, uh, I, I only got to see him, like, through videos, because right. I was uh, really young. But right. then I, I worked with his son, with Martin Garahan, in, right. in the transmission. So I asked him some things about him sometimes, yeah. Incredible. Striker of the ball. No one could hit it like him. He could just send the ball a mile. Have you recovered from the uh, World Cup celebration, the Argentine victory? Well, it, uh, I think, it, I mean, football in Argentina, it's uh, it's a passion. It's beyond the sport, you know, so right. everybody was involved. It was not only that the, the football fans were uh, uh, waiting to see what was going to happen with the national team, but the all the country as a whole, yeah. all the people who Whenever they followed the sport, they were also connected with the team and everything. And um, when they start uh, going through the stages, it was getting more and more mad in right. Argentina. And when they, the team won the final, it was uh, it was incredible in all around the country. You know, I'm from Buenos Aires, so I got to see, uh, you know, the Abelisco, which is the, the the center of the celebrations right. always in Argentina. It was packed. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, it was, yeah, as you said, all around the country, in every single city. And also last year, as a matter of fact, in Soto Grande, one of the players of the national team, uh, Alejandro Gomez, Papu Gomez, who is playing in, in Sevilla, which is located around two hours away, was in Soto Grande because he's very close to Polito Pieres, so right. he was there a couple of days. So now some people who are there, they say nowadays that they have a picture with one of the champions. So, <laughs> and actually, about La Padania, they only lost one game in Palermo, and it was the one that wow. you were talking before, the final of 86 against right. Palermo. That was the only game they lost in, in, in Palermo with a the historical force and with Alfonso Gonzalo. What do you think about the new uh, La Natividad team? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a 40 goal team, definitely, but also in terms of forces, because uh, already Camilo and Barto uh, were on top of amazing horses. They right. had an amazing stream, and now they have brought Facundo over with well, an amazing stream. Yeah, well, course, to do. The same the same with Pablo, yes. I mean, Pablo and Matias McDonough, his brother, I think they, they, they will have together at least 15, 18 horses wow. uh, like a, of a top level. So right now it's, it's um, definitely a matter of horses, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, at, at least they are the team with the, the, the most pressure nowadays, yes. you know, because if you take a look at it, La Dolfina won it last year and now La Natividad, it's a team that has been set to win it. Right. You know, to win it. And it seemed like Dolphin had peaked just at the right time. No, no, I think um, both Pelon, Sterling, and, and Nero had their best games in the season. Yes. I mean, Juanma was coming back to La Dolphina after yes. some years of a lot of injuries, surgeries. Right. The same with Pelon, who who had to came from England uh, in the middle of the season to have surgery in Argentina. And then suddenly, um, it, it looked as if they prepare for the final of the Open, you know, exactly. because they were absolutely amazing all through the game, both in defense, but also in attack. Which is the right thing, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, My guess is that once La Natividad decided to replace Polito and Nachi with um, Faco and Pablo, it sent shockwaves down through the rest of the teams in Polo. How do you think the new 36 goal Laache lines up? Yeah, yeah, I think... Uh, at the beginning, I was a little bit surprised because they didn't have like a natural number four, but the, the decision now has been taken that Fran Elizalde will be sure. starting at number four, Sapo number three, uh, Hilario number two, and Polito number one. And Polito and Hilario have already played together some years in Alegría. They reached the final of the Open back in 2013. Yes. I think it's a very interesting proposal, the one that they are... Um, 
presenting here and plus I think that they don't have the pressure that La Natividad has right. so I like the 35 goal teams too we have Korea Delfina is now 35 goals I think Agustina is 35 goals and this uh, new La Ensenada team is 35 goals what do you think of them? Yeah, they played together two years ago, and after these two seasons that have passed, all four of them has grown a lot in terms of level, in terms of horses. So they're going to be a very interesting team, definitely. Yeah, and Elertina is 35 yeah. goals now, too? Elertina, um, yep, yeah, because they have three nine goalers, Nico, Gonza, Nacho Duplessis, and then Bauti Bajugar. I was kind of surprised that Bautista Bajugar didn't get raised. I thought he should go from eight to nine goals. I thought he had one of the best seasons. Played really well. What, what a great player he is. Sapo Cassette is another player that I thought should have gone back to 10 goals. I think uh, Sapo is a beast. He's a magnet to the ball. What a phenomenal player he is. The more I see him, the more impressed I am with him. What do you think of his game? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sapo definitely. I mean, he's, one, he's been one of the top players of the last 15 years, but completing what I said about Bauti Bajuar, I think this is going to be a, a a great challenge for him. He's been linked with the Latina some years ago in the organization, and then, uh, well, he left to play for, for, for La Irenita. He was a replacement for Nico Pérez, for Nico Gorinjo in Hurlingham a couple of years ago, so this is a very uh, very big opportunity for him. I so love his game. Too. Hopefully he, he, can, he, can, he can take it. Step you know? up and do it. He'll have some really big shoes to fill, taking Facundo's place. Um, I don't think anybody can take Facundo's place, but Bayou Gar had an incredible season, and I think uh, he's a great young player, and um, if anyone's up to the task, it's probably him. Um, what about Nachi Duplessis? Do you think the two of them can uh, fill the void of Ilario and Facundo? Nachi Duplessis is a great player at nine goals, but I don't think he's as strong as some of the other nine goalers. It's a tough handicap to have. You've got Facundo and Ilario and Sapo all at nine goals. Um, what type of player is, is Duplessis? Will he be able to uh, hold his own for Elostina? Will they be as good as they were? Yeah, I get it. I mean, um, look, he, he used to be like a full-time player, then he started uh, uh, leaving some tournaments, then he got married. Uh, he's an amazing uh, player. I mean, he's amazing. He, he has a couple of kids, but... Uh, and, it's not the same kind of player as, uh, as Fred, as you mentioned before. Um, but now he only plays in Argentina, actually yeah. maybe in South Africa, if he goes there for some weeks. And he will be back with the Latina. Yeah. He already played with them uh, when he had to replace Mariano Aguirre back in 2014 when they reached the final. And right. Well, let's see how it goes. He's a natural number four, so he will yeah. suit them, definitely. Incredible. Yeah. What happens with all the qualifications? Do the um, new lineups with the new teams have to requalify? Um, like La Irenita Grand Champions uh, no longer exists. Who takes their place? How does that work exactly? The qualification. Um, you mean for the like the main draw for, for the, the, for the, for the, for the triple crown? Do they have to requalify? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it gets some. It's a little bit complicated in terms of that because it's not that the teams are like franchises you know that right. the, the places are not for the teams but the ones who qualified are the players right the, every single player uh get okay. uh, get points and then it. you have to to add i mean make a team of people to together qualify. a team yeah of, of qualified players yeah it's essentially the same 40 guys they're just lining up for uh, different teams uh, what about when you have like two lahaches now um does the second Lahache have to qualify or because their players had qualified on another in, team? In the okay. way, Lahache, it's one of the teams that yeah. are new now to the to the main draw. And right. they will actually have two teams. I get it. There's no new players, nobody from the outside. They just reshifted their uh, allegiances. I was also impressed with uh, Lahache. That little team uh, just wouldn't quit. They played a lot of uh, tough games, and they, um, I think they ended up being the eighth seed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, whoever finishes in the eighth position in the, the in the Juventus Grand faces the winner. Faces the winner of the camera, as you said before. So that gives 
that the four players of the winning team of that right. playoff game the necessary right. points to be qualified sorry for my english but qualifiable right for the for the for the next year so because g squared and lonsky finished ninth and tenth they'll have to requalify yeah 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 i mean they they still um get some points but not enough for them to get into the main draw so in case they want to play together again next year right uh, they will have to play the qualification yeah how do you get a team into one of the two qualification tournaments for the uh, abierto can you just enter a team you have to um how does it work what teams get to play for the opportunity to qualify well you know you have like a deadline date to set your team right so you have a, until that date the venture so area and the remonta i guess it was called yeah 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 um remonta y veterinaria yeah you have until that date to set your team okay and unless there are too many teams uh they, they will go straight into the main draw so so far lately has been i don't know seven teams some years ago last year were eight so as they are eight they just set a, a tournament with two brackets oh, right. that's it it's not that so far has been like a previous quality to, to play the quality winning the camera deputados is quite a feat too you got to give a nuestra tierra credit they had to go through quite a few teams to get that opportunity to play la hache and um make the triple crown they just fell just a little bit short yeah yeah definitely i mean i personally i would like to see in the future like more more um live matches of camera copa pilar and right. metro because there are so many as you said before uh, the camera had uh, 16 teams mm -hmm. between 24 and 30 goals yes and it's also a great chance i don't know in nuestra tierra you had uh, jared seni playing from the us yes one yeah. of the winners but at the same time, in previous uh, in previous editions, you have I don't know James Harper, Oli Cadmore, uh, Robert Strom, um, Jesse Bray, and so many players. And I think that internationally speaking, it would it would be great yes. to have more of those uh, matches live. But also uh, for the of course for the Argentine players and for all the people who work for the people who lend horses for those tournaments right. because they they are like seven chuck games. So you, right. you need to be really well organized to play these tournaments, and plus yeah. you need to be at least four. So it's it's not an an, an impossible challenge, you know, for right. for every foreign player to go and play it. But it, the next step will be to to get them more in with more promotion for yes. everybody to know every single game. You know, I would like right. to see. There's so much competition; it's incredible. It's the future of polo. I see it as a proving ground for the six to eight goal players, players who wanna obtain that next level you know it's harder and harder now tell me who's the best woman player you've ever uh, seen that i've seen play i mean i think that mm, nina nina vesti nina clarkin nowadays uh, uh made, makes a lot of impact in every single right. tournament and game she played i mean but i was lucky enough to see uh sunny Heil yes. actually playing one game Wow. Uh, it would be like six years ago in Thailand, I guess. Right. That, that must have been on the very same year or, or the, the year before she passed. And um, But she now I think that for the ladies, uh, yeah. She, was, uh, actually, she guess, won the Open with, with Adolfo. Adolfo and Adolfo yeah. always, yeah. Says, yeah. always says that he picked her even even over some... Other right. five gold players. Thought, you know, she was the best four or five gold available. Yeah. I knew her mom, Sue Sally Hale, really well. She was a great lady. Um, we're all from the Monterey Peninsula. Just a great lady. Uh, Caroline Anye was a was a four gold player that I played with a long time ago. Who was an incredible. And she player. still plays, and it's amazing yeah. to see her playing. I had the chance to see her playing in France, not yeah. only with the ladies, but also in mixed polo, like in ten gold tournaments, in fifteen gold tournaments in Saint Tropez, and she stuff. Yeah, Andreas, you should have seen her play 25 years ago. She was amazing. All heart, that one. She wouldn't stop for anything. One more shot for you. And, and also, uh, also, Kirk, I, I want to mention um, Claire Lucas, Claire Tomlinson, who yes. just passed away. 
Oh, I didn't know she that. was. Uh, mm. I, I never saw her play. Yeah? Right. Uh, I know. I never saw her playing, but I always been told how tough and how good she was. She also mm-hmm. reached five yeah. goals. Yes. And I and, and also Marianela Castagnola, yes. who's from Argentina, who won the Republica back in 1997 with Adolfo, right. and Lolo Castagnola and Guillermo Gasset Senior. There were three uh, very important uh, ladies for the development of what nowadays it's an amazing uh, women's right. circuit around the world, I think. Absolutely. Are we going to get to see the next Dream Team with uh, Barto Canelo and Porto playing on the same team? Well, uh, actually, you mean in the Open? Yeah, the of course. Open open? Yeah, I'd love to see those boys give Colonel Suarez a run for their money. What an incredible team that would be. Yeah, and actually they played together last year in the Jockey Club Open and that was one of the best teams and everybody is speaking about that. Uh, yeah. When is going to be the moment? I think that the moment will arrive. I don't know when uh, right. because it also depends on uh, Adolfo who, yeah. as I always said, hopefully he never retired from the game because it's awesome what, what he does, not only inside the field but outside. Do you think the two best players in the world are teenagers? What, now, uh, yeah, right now, uh, <laughs> see, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, incredible. Otto, Camilo, Bardo, there. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I think that what uh, Adolfo and Facundo did, did in the last fifteen years is something similar, like what in, so, as you say, soccer or football. Right. Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo did, or I know Federer and Nadal, but they also had Djokovic during so many years. They were on top of every single major tournament in the world, you know? Yes. From Facundo. And now, uh, you know, after all those years, you, we have these uh, three magnificent players, Poroto, Barton, and Camino, coming through. Mm-hmm. They have already played in uh, and won uh, the, the most important tournaments in the world. And that's going to be a competition that we're going to get, better. get to see for many years. Yeah. Well, I've already taken up more time than I said I would take up, and I really appreciate it. Can I ask you one last question um, before we bring this to an end? Do you mind? Yes, uh, uh, w- only one thing you were speaking about, Adolfo, and what he's doing now inside the field. Yes. I think that just to complete that, uh, it's very interesting to see him because he definitely realizes what he's able to do now, how far he can push his right. you know? And it, it, it's very interesting to see how, the efforts he makes in every moment of the game, yes, to do whatever he can to help the team to to accomplish the challenge, you know. So, uh, well, there's no question that Dolfo has a lot left in the tank. Um, what an amazing player! I mean, he is the goat. Okay, last question: If you were the coach for the newly formed Argentine Olympic polo team, name for me your starting four and your alternate, please. Well, yeah. that's that's tough, you know, because <laughs> it's like uh, when when you guys, if I if I say to a to a summer from the years, look, you have to send like the ideal team of the NBA, you know. Yeah. Uh, you would like to send like a twelve. You don't get everybody in the whole history of polo. It's got to be from current players. The four players have to come from the players that played in last year's triple crown polo. Give me your starting four players. Well, definitely I would put uh, Nero as a number four, okay. whom I think is the best number four of his generation. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, yeah. Then, uh, well, it's, it's difficult, but <laughs> maybe, and, and taking a look Pablo. at what they currently <laughs> did, uh, I would say like uh, Adolfo, um, okay. Poroto, okay. Um, yeah, and Camilo, and Camilo. Camilo. Okay. And and the alternate, like a second four-man team, I would put... Uh, Barto? I would say... Sato. Well, Pablo and Barto. Pablo and Barto will be there. Maybe yeah. Barto playing okay. as a number four. Pablo as a number three. And then, well, Facundo as a number one, definitely. And as a number two, um, well, it's difficult because there are so many that... Uh, maybe as a natural number two, I would, I would say uh, Ilario. You know, I would like to have Pelon, but Pelon is from Uruguay, and 
Yeah, I'll find you the same amount of retirement. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was um, and now you have to tell me your my your Okay, well, I'm going to put um, Barto at back, Sapo at three, Peroto at two, and Hedda at one. And Facundo is my alternate player. That's an interesting thing. That's a good one. Well, Andres, thank you so much for your time. Um, I took way too much of it. You've been a real sport. And the connection just dropped. But if not, I know you got, you're busy today. You've got the finals going. It'd be it's weird. Great. So I, I try to, um, to give more information to, to, for them to, to be a, a, a better moment, you know, to, to watch the game and everything. Yeah. So that's my, that's what I try to do at least. Thanks for coming in. Hopefully. I appreciate it. Take care. Thank you, Rick. Here, here, here. Catch all the high goal polo action of the Triple Crown at live.aapolo.com. That's live.aapolo.com. You've been watching Kirk's Polo Report. If you haven't subscribed, please do. And as always, be safe. Thank you and good night.